Welcome. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> it's good to see you all here tonight. I'm Jim Milliken. I'm the chair of the Concord Historical Society. But uh, by the way, we do a lot of good things with the New Hampshire Historical Society. And I've got a little announcement to make about that. And that is not this, the month of June, we're going to be doing a program on Swenson's Granite Company. And we've got Kurt Swenson coming to make the presentation, but we believe this is going to be too small an area, so we're going to be over at the New Hampshire Historical Society. And that's going to be quite an event. You'll really enjoy that one. That's June. May, where we have a good program all ready to go, but we don't have an absolute commitment, and so I'm kind of stuck. But I really uh, encourage you to come next month, too, because I know that the ones plan is pretty like 99%. We're just getting it confirmed. Um, another thing I always like to mention is that the Waka Lecture Series helps us put these on, and they are excellent people. Uh, and one of these days, we're going to do a program on the Waka Lecture Program because that's been around for many years and has been contributing to so many things in our community that it's, uh, they're fabulous. And, uh, and we're one of the things that uh, gets some support. That being said, uh, you might know our speaker tonight. <laughs> they're funny. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer Kredovic has been a uh, a huge supporter both of our historical stuff and the Concord Historical Society but as you all know she's a tremendous supporter of our community and has taken on so many roles over the years where I perhaps met her the first time was in the 2020 uh, program if that means anything to you uh, Mayor Verano back in the 90s uh, wanted to put some plans together what the year 2020 was going to be like in Concord. And the plan started then as to putting things together and you know what our downtown looks like now. Well, it wasn't like that 20 years ago. And quite frankly, the Historical Society came out of some of that work. Early on, uh, Bill Barry, Bill was our first president, by the way, first chair. Uh, he and Doug Black had, had given me a call and said they wanted to put something together and ask, them, ask me to help them do that, and here we are. So we're really pleased to be here again tonight. But tonight we want to, uh, Jennifer's going to have a little fun, and you're going to have some <laughs> fun too. We're talking about early history, Concord, um, and some of the legends, some of the things that have happened over the years. And you may have wondered why things were a certain way, or where did certain names come from? Uh, this is the opportunity. And it's also an opportunity for you to think about what do you remember in some of your family stories, and or what do you hope to leave, what do you hope to leave behind to make Concord such a beautiful place to live and grow up and work? So that being said, oh, we have one more coming. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, I'll let him come through the door, that's all. And then we'll get started. No other door. We're at the back. Welcome. Jennifer Credit. Hi, everybody. <laughs> all right, are we ready to have some fun? I'm going to do my very best. It's been one of those uh, winters where uh, you never know how long my voice is going to last, so I'm going to do the very best I can. My hope for today's conversation really is to give you a sense of the history of Concord that covers a few different viewpoints of Concord's past. It is purposeful that I selected this quote. We write what should not be forgotten because we document our history to share what is important with the next generation. Sometimes we write things down because we're creating our own legacy, as Jim alluded to. And the space between this history and legacy is really called storytelling. So I'm gonna share some stories with you. Our first is a trip through time that's going to take us back to Concord 1550. 
1740. Well, that's a long amount of time, but let's see how we do. Our first legend, when we talk about the history of Concord, New Hampshire, we cannot forget the time before the English settlers came up from Massachusetts to settle here along the bend in the river of the Merrimack. This land was home to the Penacook tribe of the Abenaki. It was not a chance encounter across the field. It was foreseen. It was prophesied. My first story is about Passaconaway, the sage or sachem of the Penacook, also referred to as Peas Conaway, Papa C. Quinio. The spelling of these names are also quite varied, and much of this comes from the vast land areas of the Abenaki. And much like today, we have so many different dialects across the United States, it's the same. It was true of the Abenaki Algonquin territories. American author Samuel Drake theorized that all of the variations for the name Passaconaway translated into the English words child bear, or in the night sky, Ursa Minor, the Little Dipper. This is where the story becomes fantastic and fanciful. Passaconaway was thought to be born somewhere around 1550 or 1570, and he died somewhere around his 116th year. Yes, 116 years old. If you find that a bit out of the norm, know too that he had supernatural powers. Our little bear could see everything from his skyward view over the lands. Even before 1620 and the pilgrims landing at Plymouth Rock, a European ship captain reported seeing a huge native standing atop a cliff, a Conway. The ship was passing a Conway, the translation, hound of the plain at the Holy River. Passa Conway had been summoned to the Plymouth area to assert his super, supernatural powers to rid the land of the pilgrims who were building a village on the shore. And the legend continues. He tried all of his powers and he failed. After receiving a vision from the great bear, Ursa Major, or the spirits within the constellation of Ursa Major, it was foretold there would be doom for the tribes. And so he stopped his curses and his supernatural afflictions, and he began to advocate seeking peace with the settlers. This statue that we're looking at here is located in Edson Cemetery in Lowell, Massachusetts. This chance encounter across the field when the Massachusetts settlers ventured their way up the Merrimack River and reached here, Pennycook, the legend goes that Passaconaway crossed the fields at Horseshoe Pond and welcomed the settlers in their native language. It was not his own language. The great dying of 1616 to 1619 from historic Ipswich, their reverend called this by God's visitation, a wonderful plague. In truth, it was a terrible plague. It killed more than two thirds of the Native Americans because they had no immunity to smallpox. The death of our tribes extended through the Algonquin in Massachusetts to the Iroquois and the Mohawk in New York State. For Passaconaway, his family welcomed their third child, Juana Lancet. His name is important for being the heir to Chief Passaconaway. The baby was blessed by the elders with the name Wanda Lancet, Wane meaning pleasant, and Nanshunat meaning to breathe. And through this jumble of letters and guttural sounds, we derived Wanda Lancet, a more pronounceable word signifying pleasant breathing. You recognize this building, the Wanda Lancet building at the corner of North States and Pleasant Street. It is not by chance the road is called Pleasant Street. It is named for 
want a lancet. John Mason is a London merchant, and he received one of the first land grants in New Hampshire. After serving as the governor of Newfoundland, Mason, along with Sir Fernando Georges, uh, received a patent, I think it's gorgeous, received a patent from the Council of New England for all the territory lying between the Merrimack and the Kennebunk Rivers. In 1629, they divided the grant with Mason taking all of his share, which he named New Hampshire, after his homeland, Hampshire, in England, though he himself never stepped foot here in the Americas. King Charles II declared New Hampshire a royal colony being decreed separate from Massachusetts in 1629. And in 1726, Massachusetts granted permission for us to settle here in the area that would become Concord. So you should be wondering why this gap of time between 1679 being named a, a separate royal colony and in 1726, Massachusetts saying we can settle here, you can start to see why it is that we've always had this little bit of, of um, contention with the state of Massachusetts. History is someone else's interpretation of actual events. Generally speaking, if you read the Eastman Monument that's in East Concord paying tribute to our ancestral forefather, Ebenezer Eastman, one of the first settlers of Concord arriving here in 1727, with Ebenezer leading the way. Of course, if you are a well-to-do descendant of Ebenezer's family and you have the means to erect a statue in his name, you can carve whatever it is that you want on that statue. While other records show that Henry Rolfe and Richard Uran spent time clearing the land in the winter of 1726, but then in May of 1726, the records show these Massachusetts settlers were greeted by Judge Samuel Sewells, who had been living on a 500-acre tract of land. This land is near Sewell Falls Road. Judge Samuel Sewell is quite famous for his participation in the Salem Witch Trials, whereby 30 people were found guilty under his and two other judges' rulings. 19 of those souls were executed. Five died in prison and one died by torture, refusing to admit his guilt to the court's judgment. In 1700, Samuel Sewell wrote what is believed to be the very first essay in the colonies criticizing slavery. He also declared his apology for his judgment in the witch trials. Sewell's Falls and Sewell's Falls Island were designed in the 500 acre lot being in the wilderness of Pennycook. And it was granted to John Hull, his father-in-law. It became known as Sewell's Farm in 1695 when Judge Samuel Sewell inherited the land upon his father-in-law's passing and he and his wife Hannah moved here. Joseph and Edward Abbott, John Merrill, and 40 or 50 others had arrived to the plantation. They cleared and fenced lots and built a blockhouse to be used as a garrison and a meeting house. Captain Eastman, this is Ebenezer now, his wife and his six young children. They were the first family to live in Pennycook, and they were given that designation. The first family to settle in Concord, New Hampshire was Ebenezer Eastman, rather than just being the first settler. In 1730, the Reverend of Pennycook is hired, and it is our well-appreciated Timothy Walker. His home is still standing here on North Main Street, just down uh, a couple from this house here. His time as Reverend is captured in his memoir entitled Diaries of Reverend Timothy Walker. Just a year later, our first school opened here. To give you a sense of the compensation and wages, Timothy Walker was paid 100 pounds a year for his service. Hannah Abbott was our very first teacher. She made 10 pounds a year for the instruction 
of children in reading. The Massachusetts General Court created a new township to be called Rumford in 1733 and recognized as self-governing in 1734. Sir Benjamin Thomas was a famed British physicist born in colonial Massachusetts, and he is best known for his revolutionary theories in thermodynamics. We're gonna talk about that a little later. Wanting to make sure we don't miss out on any mythological sides of our history, there were dragons here, though they were actually the king's American dragoons. Founded by the Count Rumford, the term dragoons was defined as a mounted infantry. Then, after years of disputes with our neighbors to the south, in 1740, King George II approves the boundary between the two colonies of Massachusetts and New Hampshire, and Massachusetts loses 28 chartered towns in that decree, including Concord and Penacook. And this completes the first segment, 190 years or so. We're gonna take a look at some more important histories covering 1765 through 1914. This is a great quote from Janis Joplin, and while it is out of time, it does make sense here. Don't compromise yourself, you are all you've got. Concord, in fact, is just that, it's a compromise. You've seen evidence of the bitterness between Massachusetts and New Hampshire, but it hits a little closer to home when we talk about the bitter dispute between the town of Rumford and the town of Bow. As is typical, there was this boundary dispute between the two towns. Governor Benning Wentworth had to step in and settle the, the dispute, and so he changed the name of Rumford to Concord in order to make a new Concord or a harmony between two towns. Concordians, however, are not so fond of his nephew, John Wentworth. He was an opportunist who snuggled up to the rich people and the well-to-do in Portsmouth. And once he called the population of Concord an outpost of radical republicanism. The shot heard round the world happened on April 19th in 1775, and it was the start of the Revolutionary War. In Concord, Reverend Timothy Walker tells his neighbor, we must fight, John, we must fight. Meanwhile, in our neighboring town of Epsom, Captain Andrew McClary stops his plowing in the fields to gather up 34 men and he leads them on a 70 mile walk to Cambridge, Massachusetts to oppose the British. By the end of the month, more than 2,000 New Hampshire men have joined the Minutemen and they fight under the leadership of Colonel John Stark. The painting is from John Trumbull. It's titled, Death of General Warren at the Battle of Bunker Hill. Major Andrew McClurry is standing right there underneath the flag, and he is there to protect the dying General Warren. Now, it's April of 1776, and concerned about the Tories in their mess, New Hampshire, their committee of safety prepares the association test. It's a pledge of allegiance to the Patriot cause. Signers promise to the utmost of our power and the risk of our lives and fortunes with arms, oppose the hostile proceedings of the British fleets and armies against the United American colonies. All sane white males 21 years and older are to sign or reject this oath. In the ensuing months, more than 8,500 men will sign and less than 800 will refuse, but those 800 will flee the state, leaving all of their possessions behind. We do know later that year in July, we declare our independence from Britain. We can only see a short distance ahead, but we can see plenty there that needs to be done. In honor of this week, the 2024 Eclipse Day, I thought it would be appropriate to share with you New England's darkest day, which was May 19th, 1780. New England and Canada went completely dark. 
where even at noontime candles were required. The extraordinary darkness brought significant fear and praying. Generally, the Christians believed it was Judgment Day. Much like smoke and haziness that we had last summer, this was all caused by Canadian wildfires. Historically, the Abenaki believed in one supreme being. being. They honored the spirits of the animals and the plants and the four winds. And Mother Earth, Father Sky, Grandmother Moon, Grandfather Sun, and the mythical hero Gluskabi. They were personified to enhance relationships and connections to the environment. This statue of Glusabi is located in Nova Scotia. Every culture around the world has a sun and a moon myth. Some place, places depict the sun as a female chasing a male moon around the sky. Others see the moon as the female being chased by the male sun. In some myths, they are siblings and in others they are lovers and still others depict them as mother moon who gave birth to her son, the sun. This is the view of Main Street from 1798, but the Main Street was first laid out in 1785. Mr. H.E. Hebert's store was of high importance for the general goods that were sold inside. The building is said to be 57 rods from the great tree. Many of the structures along Main Street are measured from this great tree. Others are measured from the stone. The great elm being situated at what is today the Holiday Inn at the corner of Main and Center Streets. And the stone was located across from today's Fayette Street on South Main. Concord's Heart is Main Street. Even today, originally known simply as the street, in the days when people came from outlying districts to trade with Mr. Hebert's store, it was said that no man from any section of New Hampshire, however remote, could walk down Main Street on two consecutive days without meeting someone that was his neighbor. Is it not interesting you could probably do the same even today? As the marker reads on June 21st, 1788 at the Old North Meeting House, New Hampshire's delegates took up the roll call vote, 57 yeas, 47 nays. As the ninth state voting in favor of ratifying the Constitution, mounted riders who were waiting outside the church sped away to carry the news to New York. Their convention was in session in Poughkeepsie and to the Virginia Convention assembled in Richmond, all spreading the great excitement that the United States of America was born in the Old North Church of Concord, New Hampshire. In 1808, Concord be became the capital and construction on the State House began in 1816. The State House, built of Concord granite and completed in 1819, Visitors from all over the state of New Hampshire and from other regions from the country came to see it, and they pronounced it one of the finest buildings in the United States. Even today, it is notorious for being the oldest state house in the nation where the legislature still meets in their original chambers. The original eagle on the top, carved in wood, was placed atop the dome for the first time in 1818. June 22, 1825, the citizens of Concord in the state of New Hampshire listened to the oratorio given by the New Hampshire Musical Society in honor of Marquis de Lafayette's visit to the state capitol. Concord entertained the nation's guest with unrestrained magnificence until late at night. It was filled with festivities of all kind. In the afternoon, afternoon it was said that there was a meal that was served to seven to 800 people at a table. The guests included 200 Revolutionary War heroes, and they were all served under a huge pavilion on the State House lawn. 
There was the so-called Lafayette Elm on the grounds, and it was said to mark the spot where Lafayette, the guest of honor, sat that day. It was at this dinner that the name of the Granite State was first applied to New Hampshire in a song written by Colonel Kerrigan. William Kent was host to Lafayette. You may recognize this home. It sits on South Spring Street today. It is the home of William Kent, and it used to reside on Pleasant Street. The house was moved in 1835 to make way for the building of South Congregational Church. Fun facts. Ralph Waldo Emerson, he married his first wife in 1829 at the William Kent home. This American essayist, lecturer, philosopher, abolitionist, poet, was seen as a champion of individualism and critical thinking. We refer to him as Ralph Waldo Emerson, and he preferred being called just by his middle name. He is the original Waldo. Since we can, here's one of Waldo's famous quotes. What lies behind us, what lies before us are tiny matters compared to what lies within us. The house next door to South Congregational Church was that of Lewis Downing Jr., the founder of what he called a wagon company in 1813. Lewis Downing is no doubt a familiar name. The house still stands today and it is one of the few structures in the city that can still be attributed to Lewis Downing. In 1828, Downing was joined by Stephen Abbott to form the Abbott Downing Company. Over the century, Concord coaches were built here, the most famous being the Concord coach. We are proud to say that the West was one through Concord, New Hampshire with our stage coaches. It was no joke that on April Fool's Day, Concord citizens formed the, citizen, uh, the city's first temperance society. It is 1830. Navigation along the Merrimack was fairly significant from 1815 to 1842, whereby the population doubled over that 27-year span. The Concord Railroad Corporation obtained its charter in 1835, the same day as the Boston and Lowell Railroad. That was opened on the same as the Boston, that, sorry, the rail line was opened for travel and the same year that the Boston and Maine was chartered. But the original purpose of the grantees under the Concord Railroad was for us to have a line from Lowell to Concord, not Boston to Concord. Finances being much of the debate and participation in conversations at the state legislature, city officials, the business leaders of the day, confidence finally shifted and finally, in 1840, we made this happen. On September 6, 1842, the engine Amiskay rolled into Concord to thunderous cheers. Even today, our community mourns the loss of the Concord Railroad station. The station depicted here was actually the fourth iteration of the passenger depot in Concord, the first having been built in 1847 and the last being torn down in 1959-1960. Acres of buildings existed in South Main Street for the repair and the refit of the rail cars. Concord became an economic hub for the region, and it was due to the Boston and Maine. You've heard of Morse code, but are you aware that Samuel Morse started his career as a mechanic here in Concord, New Hampshire. He sent his first telegraph message in 1844. New Hampshire businessman Benjamin Brown French will soon join Morris and others in the Magnetic Telegraph Company, and he calls it one of the greatest inventions of the age, and he predicts that will eventually be laid down all over the Union. Other inventions to come out of Concord our physicists, do you remember the Count Rumford, Benjamin Thompson? He invented the first kitchen stove and also the first drip coffee maker and the first double boiler. The first alarm clock was from Levi Hutchins. 
Sylvester Marsh gave us the Mount Washington Cog Railway. He came up with the idea in 1879. He was hiking up the mountain. He's like, there's gotta be a better way to get up here. So he created the cog. And the first steam engine tractor, which became the Caterpillar Tractor Company, was started here in Concord, New Hampshire. That was in 1890. It's now called Holt and Best. John Parker Hale, he's the one over here. He and Franklin Pierce debated slavery before an overflow crowd at the Old North Meeting House in Concord. After one anti-slavery speech from Hale, a veteran known as Old John Virgin blurted out, give it to him, Jack. Drive the poor vipers into their dens and make them pull their holes out in after them. In response to a pro Southern argument from Pierce, Hale proclaims, I will never bow down and worship slavery. A great quote here by Martin Luther King. If you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you must keep moving. It is appropriate to speak about the importance of resilience and the stick to of the new Northeast that we have here. Our worst fire in history, there's no photographs of this. We often talk about our authentic downtown and the downtown buildings that are there. It's because they were built in the mid 1800s. It started somewhere in the vicinity of Merchant's Block, which is near Low Avenue and it quickly spread through the wooden structures, one building after another, and it kept running its way up east side of Main Street. With little else support beyond the bucket brigades, by the time the sun rose, all of North Main Street, from Low Ave and Depot Street to Center Street, and all the way to the river was gone. From this, there was a decision by all city leaders that we will rebuild our main street in brick and granite because we will never be consumed by fire again. Concord is in motion to build and rebuild and we approved the construction of the first Sewell's Falls Bridge over the Merrimack and it's 1852. On a cold March 1st, 1860, then Senator Abraham Lincoln comes to New Hampshire on a whistle stop tour to speak to the citizens of Concord, New Hampshire at our Phoenix Hall. The auditorium is standing room only as the Senator takes the stage. He talks about the important conversations of the times, including slavery. Remember our own Franklin Pierce supported the continuation of slavery while Lincoln was opposed. He uttered this phrase, slavery was like putting a snake in the bed of a sleeping child. It was a phrase he uttered across the country and it won him the presidency. Here in Concord, it was met with great applause because we'd already abolished slavery back in 1858. In July, Concord dedicates what has been a picnic and gathering spot as the Blossom Hill Cemetery with the population having doubled from 1840 to 1860, we now boast nearly 11,000 residents. Know thy enemy, or know thyself, know thy enemy, a thousand battles, a thousand victories. April 12, 1861, we are at war with ourselves. It is the North against the South in the Civil War. By April 21st, Captain Edward Studevant, Concord's Knight Constable and now the state's first volunteer for service in the Union Army, marches a squad of volunteers into South Congregational Church for Sunday services. With Union armies still faltering on the front, 30,000 soldiers gather in Concord, New Hampshire for the formation of the Public Loyal Union League of the state. Bands, speaker, Speakers and marches are the order of the day. 
the state legislature takes up the notion of removing Concord as the state capital. John George wins the day by arguing that, in addition to lagging behind Concord in the railroad development, Manchester has a population that is, quote, not steady and sober. Passions, excitements, and tumults are likely to be generated at any time from Manchester. 42 years after becoming Concord's Congregationalist minister, the Reverend Nathaniel Booten resigns. During his tenure, Booten became a trustee of Dartmouth College and in 1856 published a history of Concord. Seven months before leaving the pulpit, he was named our state historian. Long Pond, now known as Penacook Lake, is selected as Concord's primary water source. Three years later, the water is flowing through the city's first water pipes. Staying on the theme of water, Concord opens its first official fire station, forming the Concord Fire Department. They move into the station after construction is complete and service begins in 1875. Public transportation becomes an important navigation throughout the city of Concord with our first trolley service starting in 1881. If you believe that spring starts somewhere in March around the vernal equinox, know that in Concord, it is actually the Mayhorn blowing that starts spring. The Concord Monitor reports in 1891, our city's oldest inhabitant, cannot recall a first day of May in his boyhood when the din of the horn did not reverberate in some of the wee hours of our city. We know from the time of pa uh, Pasaconaway that Sewell's Falls has magical powers and the land on the island is sacred and spiritual. At Sewell Falls, George and Charles Page of the Page Belting Company, they open the second hydroelectric dam of its kind in the United States. The powerhouse is equipped with four 2300 volt, 20, 225 kilowatt generators that are driven by leather belts created at the Page Belting Company. Sewell's Falls will generate power until 1968. Trivia. The most famous hydroelectric power station in the United States is Niagara Falls that was first opened in 1896. Famed Scottish golfer Willie Campbell comes to Concord in 1896 to lay out our first nine hole golf course and it is Beaver Meadow. 10,000 people attend the dedication of the Memorial Arch in front of the State House Cut from Concord granite, it is 33 feet, eight inches high and 53 feet wide. Though it is built on state land, it was paid for by the city and it commemorates Concord's war veterans. Oh, this is a big day in Concord. A referendum on the city ballot to end prohibition sees 75% of the voters turn out and liquor sales become approved. Prohibition ends after a 48-year ban. Not that I'm too excited about that. The Monitor reports on the opening of the New England Telephone and Telegraph Exchange, a two-story building at School and Green Streets. On the upper floor, there are two payphones staffed by attendants. Female operators at the switchboard regularly ask, number please, making connections for callers, they begin service with over 1,600 subscribers. These photos were taken from Southern New England Telephone and the Monadnock Ledger. Unable to keep up with the Concord City Auditorium for live shows, manager Ben White of the White's Opera House begins showing continuous motion pictures and illustrated songs every day, but not Sunday. Admission is a dime for adults and a nickel for children. The songs are by Fred Rushlow. This venture will prove an immense success, but unfortunately, the White's Opera House burned down in 1920. Young people fan out all over Concord to raise money for the Mary Pillsbury Hospital. They pin red tags on everybody that is a donor so that we don't repeat people. 
By the end of a single day, those children raised $2,300. The White Parks beat the old timers 14 to zero in the first ever game of the Concord's Sunset League. The four team after supper baseball league holds games every night except on Saturday, promptly at 615. They will only play until dark or five innings, whichever comes first. There's about 400 to 500 people that gather to watch those games every night. Documenting the news of the day, women write in their diaries on April 15th, a large passenger ship from England with thousands of souls is lost to the sea. And this completes our second segment of our history. So now we're gonna come cover some highlights from 1915 to 2000. Sometimes dreams are wiser than waking. Concord's Board of Health urges the discontinuation of public funerals because of the Spanish influenza epidemic, which at its peak, the board strongly suggests that until further notice, kinsmen and very near friends attend only the last rites of those people that are dying. A glorious day in history, 9, 19, 19, 19. The New Hampshire State Legislature gives women the right to vote in the state of New Hampshire. It takes us back to this long march for this goal and the right to vote with the Women's Suffrage Convention back in 1869. Armenia White, the wife of Nathaniel White, was then president of Concord's chapter of suffragists. <laughs> the keynote speaker was Julia Ward Howe of Boston, and she was severe with Senator Charles Sumner, especially in his shouts to hold Cuba as, quote, technically a symbol of belligerency. Let her perish. How was firm in her cry when Sumner did this? Quote, he was untrue to the very flag whose virtue enabled his triumph. This was really bold language for a woman to say against a man in 1869. It is announced in Concord that Alan Hollis, a local lawyer and civic leader known as the Kingfish, will donate 11.9 acres on South Fruit Street and $5,000 towards a football field and other athletic facilities. This park is called Memorial Field and it is in honor of the dead from the late World War, meaning World War I. At nightfall, more than 2,000 people gather on Main Street to see the illumination of Main Street for the first time. It will be termed White Way. Mayor Fred Martin pushes the button and for the first time, Concord Electric Company's 126 large light bulbs light up the thoroughfare. In July of the same year, Mayor Martin gets to greet Charles Lindbergh at Concord Airport. The great hurricane of 1838 wreaks havoc on Concord, New Hampshire. The wind gusts are so strong that even today we have remnants of the damage on some of our steeple tops. President Franklin D. Roosevelt appoints former Governor John G. Wynett of Concord to succeed Joseph Kennedy as the U.S. Ambassador to Great Britain. Wynett, a Republican, served earlier in FDR's presidency as the first administrator of Social Security. In January of 1944, Miss Grace Blanchard, Concord's retired librarian of 40 years, dies. In her will, she leaves $40,000 in public bequests, including $25,000 to the Concord Library. That is a wow moment. <laughs> Rumford Press, which is operated here since 1897, doubles its size. The addition will cost an estimated $500,000. That is really big money in uh, 1945. The hot debate in the city. 
it has ended even today. This is 1947, and there are plans to install the city's first parking meters in the downtown, and it draws ire from Concord residents. Quote, I will make a pledge. I will never put 10 cents into the meter in order to shop. I will park my car over on Concord Plains and I will walk in first, writes Charles H. Nixon in a letter to the editor. The state of New Hampshire informs the city of Concord that they are going to extend the central turnpike straight through our city. Seems appropriate to bring this up for the times. A thousand people attended the ceremony dedicating Concord's new Runlet Junior High School in the South End. After our tour, most expressed satisfaction with the $1.4 million that was spent for the school. Meanwhile, Concord's New Hampshire Technical Institute opens in 1965. Tuition is $300, only for New Hampshire residents. If you live out of state, it is $800. Trains carrying 71 foot long laminated wooden arches arrive in the city of Concord. They are shipped from Oregon and they will become the rafters for the new Everett Arena. The arena is named after Douglas Everett. Doug was an American ice hockey player, part of the Team USA that won the silver medal in the 1932 Winter Olympics. Fun fact, it was in New York at Lake Placid. I'm guessing that, I think it's right though. To the shouts and jeers of Mayor J. Herbert Quinn's supporters, Concord's Board of Aldermen vote 13 to one to impeach the mayor. Quinn's main offense, an attempt to engineer the arrest of the Monitor's editor James Langley on a drunken driving charge. Quinn will appeal his dismissal in the courts, but they will keep the ouster. It will stand. About 350 people attend a memorial service at the State House for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the civil rights leader who was assassinated in Memphis. In a statement drafted in conjunction with other local clergy, Reverend Paul Beatty, a Unitarian minister, suggests that the nearly all white Concord should seek to diversify. Concord builds a pocket park and they call it Bicentennial Square. Before the square was developed into a pocket park, it was a maze of these narrow passages that were lined with small brick sheds and shops most of them were devoted to servicing automobiles. Workers in Eagle Square finished working on the park fountain. Meanwhile, there was a celebration to mark the opening of Eagle Square. Former mayor Marty Gross delivers a poem to mark the occasion. One stanza describes the Eagle Stable, which will soon be open in the Crystal Courtyard, a mini mall for specialty foods. On a cold day, on a January morning, Concord loses one of its finest citizens. We mourn for the loss of one of us, a teacher, Krista McCulloch. Concord opens the Steeplegate Mall, a decade-long endeavor and a vision of the DeMonte family. The refurbished Capitol Center for the Arts reopens on South Main Street. The opening show features folk singers like John Sebastian, Jonathan Edwards, Janice Ian, and New Hampshire's own Tom Rush. Concord's skate park officially opens behind the Everett Arena, and about 100 skaters immediately begin sliding, ramping, and jumping to their heart's content. A lot of kids go here, so I can learn all the moves, says Josh Meekins, a middle schooler who plans many returns. He goes on to say, I never could do that before. And while this takes us up to the year 2000, Concord is very fortunate to have a strong documentation of our history from the Boughton history through the Lyford history and then to the 20th century history called Cross Currents of Change. 
That is what the Concord Historical Society has contributed to the community is the continuation of this history. We leave the other stories to the next generation of writers and story makers and what other stories did we miss that you might want to know. Your legacy should be that you made it better than it was before you got it. These are the photo credits. So Jim, you wanna lead us? Is there something that we missed that you wanted to learn more about? How did we do? Do we cover enough from you? That's a long time. <laughs> Fantastic. Wow. Thank Nicely you, sir. Nicely done. Thank you. Yeah. What do you think? <laughs> now is your chance to ask some questions. Well, what are some of your memories? Isn't this fascinating? I, I recognized a lot of it. I'm questions. sure you did. <laughs> Any, did you have any questions? Yeah, question. please. Do they know what started that big fire that destroyed the... They do not. Um, it happened so quickly by the time the, the town constable actually saw that there was a fire, there was much consumed. And if you, if you recognize Low Avenue, it's actually off of Main Street. It's not on the Main Street, and the constable would have been walking Main Street. And so by the time he saw the fire, it was already, there was no stopping it, is my understanding. From, from when you read the histories, the anxiety that people had when this was happening was just tremendous. Um, they couldn't stop it, they were a bucket brigade. We didn't have a Concord Fire Department, and they were all wooden structures. So there was nothing to happen but tinder burning. Um, if you think about Phoenix Hall, Phoenix Hall has been rebuilt multiple times, but the first time it burned down in the, uh, before 1800, it was called Phoenix Hall because it was a building rising out of the ashes. And so that's really what um, people recognized in when we had that huge fire um, that we needed to rebuild in something that would retain us. And there, on the other side of the street, there really was only one wooden structure left They'd already redone the street in brick and granite. How did it? Yeah. Just so you know, if we don't know the answer, we make it up. <laughs> did you see anything else in there? That uh, this was a snapshot of all those different things. Some of you, how many people have lived in Concord more than twenty years? What? Okay, so you saw. You, you You're on 70 years? Yes. That's fantastic. I was born here. <laughs> Did you, so you must have recognized some of this stuff from the 1900s. Oh, yeah. There was a lot that happened. We often talk about Main Street. Um, in the, the picture about the lighting of Main Street in 1947, there was always this um, these steps up to these grand houses on South Main Street. And when in 1950, there was a redesign of Main Street. You can see like at the Capitol Center, there's steps, but it doesn't really go to the entry to the Cap Center. There's another entry here. And that redesign created that, what we used to have the double step curve on Main Street. Um, it was kind of a challenge that started in the 1950s when they redid Main Street and I think it was 1980, you were the, mm -hmm. the president of the chamber at the time, yep. right? Yes. And you guys had a say about Main Street. What was the digger and... Oh, uh, plumber and digger. Plumber and digger. They were kept, you do remember plumber and digger. I, I thought I might be the only one. They were redoing the main water line, which was underneath Main Street and it meant the road was going to be gone. And we have all these businesses, and remember, Main Street is the heart of the community. It has been since 1785. That hasn't changed. And when we think about Main Street, it serves 23 surrounding communities as well. This is a heart of community, and it does start in that main corridor. So they had Plumber and Digger, as part of the redevelopment of Main Street, the main line, the sidewalks, the everything. And what was consistent in their messaging is, we're gonna be okay for the merchants, we're gonna get through this, we're gonna make it fun with Plumber and Digger, they were these characters, to get people to come downtown, and we were going to retain 
our red brick downtown, right? Exactly. exactly. So there's reason and purpose, even today in the new Main Street design, why the red brick stayed because it is authentic to what we had in the downtown. There was a time when there were the wooden platforms and the wooden platforms burn and they fall apart. And when they redid Main Street, as the platforms would go, they would redo them in a red brick. There's one of our future uh, presentations will be down, creation of the downtown as you know it today. Uh, and you're gonna get a big kick out of that because you'll see how it, how it grew and came to be what it is. Uh, but over an awful lot of controversy, people were unhappy and uh, all kinds of uh, discussion took place. And the very best part of what was happening like with Plummer and Digger, there were articles every single week in the newspaper explaining to everybody what was going on and including them in the, in the discussion. And, uh, so be, the, the, that project became an event and it was, it was fun, and people would go down and, and uh, be part of it. You know how you uh, always love to see some construction going on? Remember how they used to cut holes in the walls so you could look through? There was some of that. But uh, the merchants were really, really concerned. And stressed. Yeah. <laughs> That's a, and, a, a light way to put, put, yeah. to put it. It's their livelihood. But groups got together. And it was promised that every time construction was going on in front of your store, there would be a special platform and walkway into your store so that you could be celebrating what was going on on the outside. And quite frankly, the merchants made more money <laughs> during that period of time than what they probably ordinarily would have because it was a fun place. People wanted to come downtown and watch the construction. And uh, that, that would be another presentation about seeing the, the wooden water pipes that were taken oh, yeah. up. And I mean, wooden water yeah, pipes. Yeah, 100 years old kind of thing. Uh, we, didn't talk too, we didn't talk too much about Swenson Granite or the granite companies that were up on the hill because Kurt Swenson is going to talk about that in our program in June. Um, the Rumford Press was super important here because it was a, a major part of the history um, and jobs for people. And again, you could, we could have a presenter that simply talked about the Rumford Press. So we just wanted to touch on things and not go into a lot of detail because they really could be their own hour-long presentation. The Rumford Press was where the Reader's Digest was produced for years and years. And when the day came, uh, internally they had to make some de decisions about whether they were going to keep having the Reader's Digest done here. And it, part of it was transportation costs and so forth. Paper, paper was on the rise yeah. as well and the paper industry here in New Hampshire had kind of collapsed where they were getting their paper from. Even though it wasn't here, other mills around the state were providing um, paper. And that that was the end, essentially, of the Rumpet Press as being the primary employment organization in the community. In fact, I probably knew, I worked at the Rumpet Press. You've done so many things. <laughs> um, it, it was exciting there, totally different, but I was, I was a teenager, 17 or 18. And, you know, we're starting new conversations in the city around diversity, equity, inclusion, justice, and belonging especially for our new American communities. And we've always been uh, kind of a hub of immigration settlement here, though they haven't always been from uh, nations of people with, of color. And so that flavor changes over time. But in the 1980s, we started the tolerance. Yeah. Uh, the task force task for tolerance, tolerance against, against racism. racism. And, yeah. I'll uh, say changes. that again, because I cut him off. It task was, force against racism and intolerance. Oh, so yes. And that is the predecessor of today's multicultural festival. Mm -hmm. And um, actually, the, and just a quick yeah, aside, St. Paul's Church in 1983 burned down. Uh, the, but the walls were still there. 
and the decision was made there to rebuild St. Paul's Church within the existing walls. And there's a, that's another whole story. Right. But there was some money left over. I happen to be treasurer, by the way. And uh, there was some money left over, so we created, what do you suppose it was called? The Phoenix Fund. And that money, having come from the fire, was devoted to dealing with the discrimination and, and those types of issues that were taking place in our community to a degree that uh, people were really uncomfortable and we did something about it. And that's why I say today, we're a pretty open and, and welcoming community compared to what it could be. But uh, we, there's always room for improvement. So okay. we always try. Um, Concord itself, we stopped slavery in 1840, but it wasn't passed by the New Hampshire legislature until 1858. And then, of course, the Emancipation Proclamation was 1865. It didn't even get around to all areas of the country. But when Lincoln came to speak here, that's really why he was so well embraced, because we were so over that. Um, and, and, and I mean it, right? It, it, was, it was really done here. When there are conversations in other communities across the state about the first in the nation primary, you guys have probably heard me say this a hundred times over, we're first in the nation for a reason. We had Abraham Lincoln here that spoke on our stage, our stage at Phoenix Hall, but he's not the first one. It's not like you can go to other states during the primaries and shake hand of the next president of the United States. And you can do that here in New Hampshire. And you can see candidates that walk down the street in New Hampshire and greet people. You see all the pictures at the Barley House. You see all of this that happens. We have our primary way. The reason is that we are very much retail politics in that you have got to look at me face to face and tell me why it is that you want to serve in whatever office it is that you're, that you're running for. I don't care if it's the city council, the school board, or the president of the United States of America, you need to look me in the eye and you need to tell me why you're worthy. That doesn't happen in other communities. In other states, this doesn't happen. They don't get to meet those candidates. So why are we first in the nation? Because we are vetting out the snakes. <laughs> we are getting rid of them. That's really what it's about is being able to tell the community and the other communities beyond that we've talked to these people face to face and this is why. And it starts with legacies like Lincoln speaking at Phoenix Hall. And he's not the only one. Teddy Roosevelt has spoken there too in 1912. We've, we've seen everybody. Barack Obama, when he started his tour, do you know where he started? Eagle Square. And he was presented by Paul Hodes who was our senator, uh, House of Representatives, I think, at the time. It's reason and purpose that people are here and they, they start here in New Hampshire. So you we'll can, fight for it. <laughs> we get, you, we're getting excited and we've been excited about the community for a long, long time. But, and we don't mean to keep you half the evening. How are we yeah, doing? And I, I want to make sure that um, I had uh, up here John Graffair for a reason. Oh, he was yeah. our executive director. He passed away. Um, last year, and it was completely unexpectedly. If you have an interest in other um, items regarding our history, we do have a timeline on our website, ConcordHistoricalSociety.org. There's a little box up there that says timeline of our history. It does not go back to 1550. The 1550 stories, I do actually have these in publications that I picked up before I ever got involved in Concord Historical Society. And these really are true Native American legends that are part of Concord's history um, regarding Passaconaway, regarding Wanalancet, crossing um, Horseshoe Pond. All of those things are part of the histories. John put together the timeline that is on um, the Concord Historical Society website, and it covers the time from Nathaniel Booten to what we did for the 20th century history. There's a lot of stuff I didn't cover there because we got to get from one place to another in an hour. Um, but 
it isn't the, own, the whole story. It's just brief enough that you can take the information and then Google it if you wanted to learn more about it. But the timeline is there. It's extraordinary. It's broken up into different years, much like I did it here, so that we could replicate that experience that's on our website. I do and want to have, talk to you. You all can be part of that. Now, yeah. That was the basis of it. part of what you, you can be participating in the future of this community. Absolutely. In so many ways. And that is amazing. That really is. You, well, well I, I know we can I used to forever. play in the state house as a little boy. I specifically yeah, um, included, I specifically included uh, Titanic because we do have people's diaries in our collection and they do talk about Titanic on April 15th, 1912. Not April uh, 14th when it happened. It's a day later before the news hits America and then they write it in their diaries. Extraordinary stuff that people wrote. So when you talk about a legacy, that legacy could be a diary. A diary that you leave behind and generations from now, someone hands it to the Concord Historical Society and we have archivists that go through it and we see what you wrote on a particular day that happened to be something of extraordinary history in the world, not just in Concord. If you have some of the Concord history even in your home or your attic or the basement, please don't throw it away. Yeah. We're interested. First. We may be able to use it, <laughs> but if we can't, that's fine. But please, we'd like to have it. I want to talk to you about our book. There are about 18 authors that are in the Concord history of the 20th century. And unlike the Boughton history or Boughton, however people pronounce it, I always said Boughton. Boughton is right. Yeah, other people are saying Boughton. Yeah. Boughton, Boughton. I've heard it both ways. Yeah, potato, potato. <laughs> uh, Nathaniel Boughton was the first, and he pretty much wrote it on his own. The Lightford history had three authors, and again, they were commissioned by the city of Concord. The and, reason, the BNM Railroad. and the B&M Railroad. The reason Mayor Verano got involved with the Concord Historical Society and brought it back to the surface was so that we could document the 20th century history. And it's a huge undertaking. If you think about all the things that happened during the Industrial Revolution and all the changes that we had in technology, churches, um, transportation, uh, education, on and on. It was a lot to cover, so about 18 authors each took a different chapter so that we put it together here. This really is a community effort. All local folks. All local folks. What is amazing is that I uncovered our very last book of paperback <laughs> today. And so there are only 18 of the paperback available, but if you're interested, you can. we don't have it online anymore. You have to have it in one of the events that we have. We also have very few of the hardcover books, and I don't mean to make this as a sales pitch because it isn't. We're almost running out of this. Um, I think that we have two, maybe three more boxes, which means it's less than 50 that we have of the hardcover book. This is the regular edition. But then we do have several of the um, keepsake, keepsake editions. This is gonna be the last one. We have a lot of these. Um, it has color photos in it. It also has a leather bound um, book, yeah. hardcover. Uh, we are grateful for Repro Graphics for printing and for New Hampshire Bindery yeah. that did the binding, but this is the keepsake one. Uh, the purchase of any of the hardcovers, um, Elizabeth Hangen and Gary Sampson, they gave us the permission to their book, Capital Views, which are buildings across the city and their history that are no longer here or here, and they still have the, their history, but it, it encapsulates a time of the buildings here in Concord, and it talks about where they came from, who was in them, et cetera. The Kimball Jenkins and the Carriage House are in the book as well. When you purchase a hardcover, you get this baby for free. And that's it, that's what I have to cover for you. Unless you're interested, remember our mythological creatures? Oh my goodness. <laughs> We talk about mythological creatures for a reason and a purpose. This is a book by Robert Rhines. Yep. I get it right? Yep. Robert Rhines was an inventor. Yes. He started the uh, Academy yep. for Science and Design. Yep. He also Franklin started the Franklin Pierce Law Center and all intellectual property 
law in the United States of America. He helped develop the cataloging system for the patents that go through the U.S. Patent Office. And that and, so it's Justice and uh, McNessie, that's Justice... Uh, Justice uh, is uh, his... Justice Rhines is yeah. his stepson? That's his son. Okay, that's his son. Robert Rhines believed in the Loch Ness, and he had several excursions over to Scotland to look for Nessie. And so as a scientist, he really did believe in this creature, mythological or not, but this is the children's book that he wrote, and he also gave, gave us in his passing the rights to the book. So we have the last of the copies available and are the in our collection. The Historical Society has his records. Yep, we have his records. Yes. That's it. That's all we have for you tonight. <laughs> if you want to write a legacy, start a diary. Thank you. Thank well you very much. Thank you. Thank you.